1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 47. I'm going to read it from the New International Version. And as we prepare, get your places in your Bible, uh, look at these words. It's on the screen. And all those gathered here will know that there is not, that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. For all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. I want you now to reach out and catch your neighbor by the hand. And this is just a, a, a point of, 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 to reinforce a thought. Turn your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. do your best. And trust God to do the rest. Turn to somebody else and say, do your best. And trust God to do the rest. Give him a praise. Give him a praise. Give him a praise. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this rich word. And we thank you for how your word gets on the inside of us and it transforms us. It, it changes us. We're clearly not the same people we once were. We are becoming new creatures, new creations. Righteousness drips from our lips. You and your glory, you're on our minds. You, you, you're, you're helping us make decisions that without you we would never make. And now, God, I pray that you will help us understand that it's not by sword or, or spear. It's not by stocks or bonds. It's not by houses or land. It's not by, by the person we know or the groups we run with. But it is you, our God, our source, our force, who will deliver everything you've ordained for us into our hands. And we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. And bless God with a praise. And trust God to do the rest. As servants of Christ and members of the kingdom of God, uh, it is expected of us to always, always do right by God. That's what it is expected of us. This is what God expects of us. Now, we may not always do right, but it is not his expectation that we not do right. His expectation is that we do exceeding abundantly above what we could ask or think, or that we meet his expectation. All right? Now, whatever I do or say will add to or take away from the image of God. That's why God expects us, watch this, he expects us to do right by him because when we do right by him, we help his image. When we don't do right by him, we hurt his image. Are you with me? Okay, let me share this with you. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Occasionally, people will look at folks in the church and call them hypocrites. They're not calling them hypocrites because they look like Jesus or act like Jesus or talk like Jesus. Usually, they're called hypocrites because they're doing something that is contrary to what Jesus would do. Amen? And so, 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 so the Lord is saying to us in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's what he says. Let your light, your light, not, not my light, not their light, but your light. Turn to somebody and say, I've got a light. <laughs> Jesus says, let your light so shine before me that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. In essence, what he said is every believer has to make a personal and serious decision, no matter the cost, that my life is going to glorify God. Whatever it costs me, whatever I have to give up. Come on, you all working with me for a minute? Whatever I have to give up. I, I might have to give up that alcohol, but my life's going to glorify God. I might have to give up that blunt. I might have to give up that pipe, but my life is going to glorify God. I might have to give up that anger. I might have to give up that greed, but my life is going to glorify God. I might have to give up that hatred, that spirit of unforgiveness, but my life is going to magnify God. God, can I get somebody to help me praise him here? So, as a child of God, uh, as a child of the King of God, to truly excel naturally and spiritually in, in the work of God, we have to make 
godly decisions or we have to make godly resolutions and then we have to do our best. Are you with me? We have to make godly resolutions or godly decisions and then we have to do our best. I gotta say that again because I'm not saying you're not making godly resolutions or decisions. I'm just saying you may not be doing your best. For okay. most of us, that's easier said than done. The resolution is hard enough, but when it comes to doing our best, it's usually in the area where we're already doing our best. You see, if you were doing the best in the area where you're making a resolution, you wouldn't need to make a resolution. Because you're already doing your best, amen? All right. It's usually in the area where we enjoy the most, the area we enjoy the most, or the area where we get the greatest satisfaction. But most of the time, when we make a resolution, it's in the area where we are not at our best. Now consider this. If we give our best, if we give our best, only in certain areas, then for most of our lives, we're going to give less than our best. What that is okay. If we only give our best in certain areas of our lives, then most of our lives, we're going to give less than our best. Watch this. If I give my best at work only, that's the only place where I'm going to give my best. Because if I don't give my best at work, they're going to fire me. Can I get three people to say amen? Amen. Can I get somebody to say amen that's been fired? <laughs> okay. So if I work 10 hours a day, and that's the only place I give my best, then for the remaining 14 hours of the day, I will give less than my best. So that means at home, I'll give less than my best. At school, I'll give less than my best. At church, I'll give less than my best. On the board, or the committee, or the team, I give less than my best because the only place where I give my best is at work. Brothers and sisters, we can't just do our best sometimes. We must resolve or make a definite and serious decision to do our best all the time. Say to somebody, say all the time. I've noticed in sports, if a team has a record of 10 and two, and they don't properly prepare and passionately play against a team with a record of two and 10, they will likely end up getting beat by a team that is clearly less talented. That's right, Have you ever seen an under, uh, 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 a team that, that doesn't measure up beat a, beat a superstar team? Oh, yeah. You ever seen that? I, I, I mean, I've seen the Warriors, and the Warriors are my team. Somebody say amen, great team. That's my team, that's my team, praise God. Members of our church, they got rings from, from the Warriors team. They gonna give me one and raise one of these days, man. <laughs> but I have seen the Warriors play an inferior team and get beat. Because watch this, they may be looking at the Spurs or looking at Oklahoma or looking at the Cavs or, or, or looking at Houston and, and, and they don't pay attention to the Knicks and they get beat. Are you with me? Sometimes it's not the big stuff that whoops you, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. And so we've got to get to the place that we do our best all the time. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, part A of the New International Version, it says, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whatever you're going to do, do it with all your might. You, may, you don't have to like doing it, but you should do it well. If, if you're told to wash the dishes, then listen, wash the dishes well. Because watch this, some of us are going to have to eat on those dishes. And we don't want you to leave half food on the dishes and we got to eat through germs from yesterday. Are you with me? Turn to somebody and say, whatever you do, do it well. Turn to somebody and say, do your best. Years ago at, Lincoln, at the Lincoln's Challenge uh, graduation, uh, the, the cadets had a model that went like this. And it says, good, better, best. Never let it rest till your good is better and your better is best. I like that. Well, they said that thing with some, with some 
enthusiasm. They said, good, better, best. Never let it rest till your good is better and your better is best. Ah! And so, brothers and sisters, realistic, if you're going to be your best naturally and spiritually, then you may need to make a godly resolution and then do your best. Amen? Then do your best. Number two, you have to prepare for the revolution. Okay? After you make a godly resolution, prepare for the revolution. The story is told of a young man who called his parents to wish them a happy, a happy wedding anniversary. It was their 40th anniversary. So he called to, to wish them a happy anniversary. His dad answered the phone, and after a few minutes of chatting, the young man asked him, he says, Dad, uh, uh, what, are you, what are your plans for your marriage in the next year? And the dad proudly answered, he says, I promise to make your mother as happy as I can all year long. Then the mom got on the phone and he asked her the same question. He said, Mom, what are your plans for the next year for your marriage? His mom replied, to see that your dad keeps his promise. <laughs> and that's a wonderful thing. Now, I understand they've been married 40 years. Initially, the mom sounds selfish, but she realized her husband meant well but she was gonna to have to help him do well. Are you, are you all with me? Anytime you see anybody that has been together for any length of time, it tells you that they are helpers one of another. Don't tell anybody I told you. People are a trip. And because we are a trip, we trip up. And watch this, and if we don't feel good about who we are, if we have some baggage from yesteryear, even when we trip, we act like we didn't trip. You're on the ground. Your face is in the earth. Are you telling me you did not fall? I'm here on purpose. I'm meant to be here. <laughs> you see, the mom knew her husband, even though he meant well, he was going to face a revolution or a serious fight as he tried to take, to turn meaning well into doing well. Listen, my friends, whenever you decide to do anything out of the ordinary, it's going to cause you, it's going to be a fight. Now, if you don't do anything, don't expect anything. If you never cook, don't ever expect to get burned. You're never going to get nothing. No grease ever going to pop on you. You're never going to touch you know, something that's hot and get burned because you never cook. Yeah. But if you decide to cook, you're going to get burned. Sooner or later, you're going to get burned. Now, get this in your spirit. Anything worth having is worth fighting for. Yeah. How many folks do you know that make a New Year's resolution every year? See, I didn't even have to say it. You said it. Yourself. They don't keep it. They don't keep it. You know why they don't keep it? Because they're not ready for the fight. They're not ready for the fight. Folks make a resolution to go to the gym five days a week, but before long that turns into five days a month, and then five days every three months, and before you know it, it's no days every month. You know why? Because they're not ready for the, I don't feel like going to the gym fight. Folks start out saying they're going to save money right after Christmas. We just, we just went into summer, you know what I mean? We just crossed over into summer. Now watch this. But you were going to save some money right after Christmas. But most folks don't do it. And you know why? Because they're not ready for the December after Christmas sales fight. They're not ready for the January white and linen sales fight. They're not ready for the February Valentine's Day jury sales fight. They're not ready for the March, we're going to get married in June, and then we're going to be up to our eyeballs in debt for the next seven years fight. I'm talking to some folks here that's like happily married and as broke as you can be. <laughs> but you got pictures. Hallelujah, I pray you got a video. It's the same when it comes to the things of God. Folks resolve to start going to Bible study in the new year. It's real quiet now. 
It's real wine. But it doesn't last. You know why? Because they're not ready for the, it's too dark, or it's too cold, or it's too hard, or I've got too much to do, or I have to get up too early for work to go to any Wednesday night or any other night Bible study. You're not ready for that fight. See how quiet it gets? Because see, with all them other things, I was talking to somebody else. But when I hit Bible study and the things of God, I can use anything. I'm talking about the prayer fight. Yeah. I'm talking about the fast fight. Yes, sir. I'm talking about I'm not going to miss worship fight. I'm going to treat my brother and my sister right fight. I'm going to ask her to forgive me fight. I'm going to stop holding that against him fight. I'm not ready for the fight. And so watch this. The devil just slapping you around. You go to Father, I stress, bang. Put your hands down. Sit your hands down. The list goes on and on and on, but you get the picture. Any resolution is almost always going to be followed by a revolution or a fight. But always remember, if it's worth having, it's worth waiting for, praying for, fasting for, and fighting for. If it's worth having, it's worth fighting for. In the book of Genesis, chapter 32, you all remember this story. Jacob, he's the son of Isaac. He's returning home after being gone for 20 years. When he left home, it wasn't pretty. Come on, are you with me? Some of us have some left home, not pretty stories. Things that happened to us 20 years ago that have not been resolved, but they still weigh heavily on us. And watch this. And you can't get where you're going because you still remember where you've been. You with me? So, so Jacob is going home after 20 years, and when he left, it wasn't pretty. Jacob had cheated Esau, his older brother, out of his birthright, and then he deceived Isaac, their dad, in the blessing him when it was rightfully Esau's blessing. Yes, sir. Now watch this. Esau was so angry that he vowed, Daddy looks like he's about to die. And as soon as Daddy dies, Jacob said word to him, you're a dead man. You like being around mama, you like cooking, and you, you, your name Jacob means deceiver or supplanter. Well, I tell you what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna plant you all right. I'm gonna plant you in the earth, okay? Tell, tell Jacob, I'm coming after. As soon as daddy dies, he's a dead man. So, so Rebecca tells him, she says, son, I, I heard something from your brother. I heard he say he's gonna kill you. So you probably need to, you probably need to get out of town. And so he leaves, watch this. Now, 20 years have passed, and Jacob is coming home. Not just because he decides to come home. He's coming home because God told him it's time to go home. You see, there's a, there's a period in our lives where we're so messed up that we cannot hear from God. You with me? But over time, after we suffer a while, after we bumped our heads and we've had some tragedies, you know what I'm saying? After we've had to cry to God because things didn't go the way we thought they were going to go, suddenly our ears are open, our hearts are primed to hear what the Lord has to say. And so God for 20 years allows Jacob to experience what it's like to be cheated, to experience what it's like to be deceived, to experience the pain of somebody taking advantage of you. And guess what? Jacob didn't like it. But God says, I tell you what I'm going to do. Now that you know better, I'm going to help you do better. And after he fixed this situation, fixed his heart, he said, now I want you to, I want you to go back home because now I think you trust me. I think you understand how I do what I do, so I want you to go back home and I, and I, want, you, I want you to trust me. And I'm gonna tell you this right now. When you get ready to fix what you messed up, it'll scare you half to death. I'm talking to three people right now, amen. You know what you said five years ago, but you haven't corrected it. Even though you're a believer, you know better. You haven't corrected because you're scared. 
You're scared that you're not going to be accepted. You're scared that you're going to be rejected. You're scared that they're going to say something that hurt your feelings. Let me tell you right now, my feelings are open, and if you decide to hurt them, to God be the glory. Because watch this. Watch this. I owe God an apology. You with me? I'm going to apologize to you, but I, but I owe God that apology. Because God has brought me too far. God has been too good. God has shown himself too strong. And I held that thing so long. And God, right now, I want you to forgive me and to show you that I'm sorry. I'm going back to her. I'm going back to him. And I'm going to let them know I did not do right by you. And God was not glorified in what I did. But please, if you can find it in your heart, if you'll forgive me. I sure would appreciate it. But if you don't, God knows my heart. Is anyone praying with me here today? Turn your neighbor and say, you gotta let that thing go. You gotta let it go, 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 you gotta let it go. And so watch this. Esau's angry, he said, I'm gonna kill you. So he goes back because God tells him to go back. Listen to what Jacob's prayer is in Genesis chapter 32, verses 9 through 12 in the New International Version. Genesis chapter 32, verses 9 through 12, New International Version. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and to your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all your kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan. Now I come back with two camps. All right, sir. You have blessed me exceedingly abundantly. My blessings overflow me. I can't handle everything you've done for me. But God, if it was not for you on my side, it would not be. So then he says in verse 11, save me. I pray from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid. I want to act like I got this thing together. I got all these, all these family members. I got all this livestock. But, but God, I'm scared of that man. I'm scared he's going to hurt me. I'm scared he's going to kill me. I'm scared he's going to reject me. I'm scared he's not going to receive me. God, I want you to know where I am and how I feel. For well, I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you, God, you say, I will surely make you prosper and make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. Yes, sir. Now, God, watch this. Manifest yourself. Yeah. Manifest yourself. What you have promised, manifest that promise. Make it obvious to the eye and to the man that it is not me doing this thing, but you, oh God. Jacob obeys God and he heads home, but he doesn't know what home is going to look like. And so he prays and he waits for a word from the Lord. Well, one night Jacob encounters an angel of God and, and the Bible says that he wrestled with the angel all night long. Now his name Jacob means, it means supplanter, it means deceiver, but it also means grabber. And so he encounters this angel, and instead of just talking to the angel, the scripture would have us to know that, 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 that Jacob grabbed the angel. No, not listening to me. Some things you never going, you never gonna have if you don't grab it. You trying to be polite. At, at times that you can't be polite, amen. Sometimes you gotta be real. You gotta be real. This is what I want. This is what I need. This is what I gotta have. This is what God has promised me. And if God says I'm supposed to have it, I don't know how I'm gonna get it, but I know what's inside of me. I know how he's wired me. And I wanna use what I have until he gives me something else. So the scripture says that that he had this encounter with this angel and he wrestled with him all night long. And I don't know what, I don't know what that means. Sometimes it's conscious wrestling. But most of the time it means that you grab something or someone and you wrestle it to the ground and you refuse to let it go until you receive the promise that you think belongs to you, until you get what you think you're supposed to have. I believe Jacob really grabbed the angel and he held on to it. Are you with me? Some of you, all you got is a promise. You about to let the promise go. I'm telling you, you better grab that thing and hold on to it. 
God's not through blessing you yet. I know it's been a minute, but God's not through blessing you yet. He still got a blessing with your name on it. He still got a miracle that's just for you. And it may not happen for everybody, and it doesn't have to, have to happen for everybody. I'm telling you right now, you just got to get to the place where you celebrate that you walk right smack down into a miracle. See, I don't need anybody to validate me. I know in many encounters, God has performed miracles in my life. And I'm not trying to deny it. I'm not trying to act like, act like it's going to happen to everybody else. What God has for you is for you. What God has for me is for me. I'm not going to deny mine. Don't you deny yours. Let's give him glory for the thing that he's done. If he blesses you the way he blesses you, blesses me the way he blesses me. When all of God's children come together, what a time, what a time. What a time. Hallelujah. Tell you what I'll do. I'll give you my testimony. You give me your testimony. And let's see what the Lord has done for all of us. And so the Bible says that he wrestled with him. He wrestled with him all night. All night long. All night long. The scripture says he wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when the day is breaking, the angel tries to leave. Without giving Jacob the blessing that he needs. Yes, but Jacob refused to let him go. I know I'm helping somebody here right now. There's some things that God put in your spirit 10 years ago. And you thought your time had passed. And God had me to come today to tell you, grab it and don't let it go. Grab it and press it to the ground. Grab it and say it's mine. Never miss your promise, oh God. So the angel tells Jacob, he says, you know what? You know what? Listen, listen, this ain't funny. The dawn is breaking. I got to go. I got to get out of here. Jacob says, I'm not going to let you go. I like this man. I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. Sometimes you just got to get mad with the devil. And you got to get firm with God. God, I know you. I know who you are. I know what you can do. And I'm not going to let you go. Somebody shout glory. So now watch this. The angel recognizes this man's serious. And so the scripture says that the angel, bang, hit him in the thigh. Because normally if you hit somebody in the thigh and you hurt them bad enough, they'll let you go to grab them. But Jacob said, I tell you what, angel of the most high God, you can beat me, you can bruise me, you can cut me, you can crush me, but unless you kill me, I'm not gonna let you go till you bless me. Oh, glory. The angel say, what's your name? The angel said, didn't even know his name. What's your name? He says, my name is Jacob, supplanter, deceiver, grabber. And the angel says, I tell you what, not only am I going to bless you, but I'm going to change your name from deceiver to planter and then grabber to Israel, which means one who struggles with God. So when you hear about Israel today, these are the descendants of the man who refused to let go. These are the descendants of the man who wrestled with God. And when I think about Jacob and his descendants, I think about me and my descendants and you and your descendants. I don't know what they're going to know about me, but they're going to know that I'm holding on to God and I'm not going to let him go until he bless me. Not only is 
your future is stake. But your children's future is at stake. And your grandchildren's future is at stake. Your lineage is at stake. You gotta hold on, turn to your neighbor. Say, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Don't let go. Do your best. I gotta get out of here. I gotta feel get out of here. Some of you today, you're going through the roughest place in your life. You feel like you can't take it. But God, He won't let you, He won't let you leave. You feel like you can't make it, but God. You feel like you can't go on, but God. You feel like you're all alone, but God, but God, but God. The Lord God promised, I'll never leave you. No forsake. That brings me to my final point. Watch this. If you're going to deal with a godly resolution and the revolution, you need to get ready for a godly solution. Are you with me? After a godly resolution, you go through the revolution, then you trust God for a solution. Most of you are familiar with the story of David and Goliath. David was a shepherd boy who did battle with Goliath, the champion of a host of the, of the Philistines, the enemies of Israel. Now David's biggest battle was not defeating Goliath. He knew he could do that. His biggest battle was convincing Saul that he could defeat, defeat Goliath. Initially, David didn't have access to Saul, so he had to convince other folks that if given a chance, he would defeat the giant. There's some folks in your life you know what I mean? They can't make any decisions, but they know the people that can. And watch this, and don't act like they don't count. Because if you don't reach them, you don't reach him. You don't reach her. And so David talked to the ones who he could reach, and he convinced them, you tell Saul, if he gives me a chance, I'll make him and God look good. As a believer in Jesus Christ, let me tell you something. There are a lot of things when I came into Jesus that I let go. A lot of things that I really liked, I let go. Because I realized God can't get glory out of that. And people can't be helped if they see that. And so you got to let that go. You got to get that thing out of your spirit. Remember when I just said, turn to somebody and say, get that out of your spirit. And so after listening to those who he trusted and talking to David, Saul is convinced if anybody can beat this giant, the shepherd boy can. Now you got to get this. David's not a soldier. He's a shepherd boy. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying he's a boy and he's a shepherd. He takes care of sheep. Bad, bad. He doesn't fight battles. He doesn't fight giants. He's a shepherd boy. Even when Samuel went to his house to get a king, his father didn't even call him because he can't be the one. He's a shepherd boy. And so Saul says if anybody can beat this giant, David can. But Goliath didn't see it that way. Listen to what he says about David in 1 Samuel 17, verse 42 through 44. I want you to know what people are saying about you. I want, I want, I want you to know why. I want you to know why you haven't gotten where you're supposed to go. Because you're listening to what folks say about you. I think Elder Hart said uh, earlier, don't worry, uh, Brother McGee, one of them, don't worry about the haters. Talk to me, son. Nobody's getting anywhere listening to haters. Just let them hate. Because see, if they had something really going for themselves, they wouldn't have time to hate on you and hate on me. They'd be doing something for themselves. Are you with me? And so the Bible says that Goliath said in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 42, the New International Version, he looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. Okay. He said to David, am I a dog that you come with me with sticks? And the Philistines cursed David 
by their gods, by his gods. Come here, he said. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Now David looks like he's the underdog. Turn to somebody and say, you look like you already lost. <laughs> he looks like he's at a disadvantage, but disadvantage, but truthfully speaking, he had the upper hand all along, naturally and spiritually, and you could tell by the way he responded. Look at verse number 45, New International Version. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and a spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day will I give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord and we give all, he'll give all of you into our hands. God tells Goliath, for 40 days, you've been bragging and taunting and shouting and talking loud about challenging us. But all of that is about to come to an end. This matter is going to be settled today. The solution is at hand. Now, Goliath may have had experience of warfare. He may have had spiritual strength. But that did not compare to David's source. Goliath had a sword and a shield, but along with a slingshot and a stone, David had the God of glory. Now watch this strategy. This, this is powerful stuff. And, and, and I just saw it. Using the sword to kill David, Goliath had to be within arm's distance. You ever try to fight somebody with a knife or a stick or, or a sword? You got to get close enough to hit them. Come on, you with me? A knife doesn't do any good if it's in your hand and, and they're at the end of the church. It's not going to help. But watch this. David's weapon of choice, a slingshot, could take Goliath out from a distance of 10 feet, 15 feet, 20 feet or more. I just realized this. Without even knowing any better, Goliath had gone to a gunfight with a switchblade. Yeah, yeah. Are you listening to me? David took that slingshot and from a distance he unleashed a stone that landed in Goliath's forehead and the giant warrior fell dead to the ground. Then to add insult to injury, he's already dead. David took Goliath's sword and cut off his head. Somebody shout glory. Now, when I said that, the Lord said that, you got to fix that, okay? Brothers and sisters, today, that was David's day. Today, we're not literally cutting off anybody's head. Not today. But for God to bless you and to bless me and to bless us and to use us, there's some things that we have to cut out of our lives. There's some people you have to cut out of your lives. You have to kill those individuals who have influence over you. And you have to cut out of your life those habits, those fears, and those doubts that keep you from being who God created you to be. Come on, brothers and sisters, take courage. It's time to take a stand. I said it before, and I'll say it again. It's no secret what God can do. What he did for Jacob and David, he'll do for you. With his arms wide open, he'll pardon you. He'll save you. He'll protect you. He'll prosper you. He'll bless you. He'll keep you and empower you. It is no secret what God can do. Now tell your neighbor, come on. Come on. Come on. Do your best and trust God to do the rest. Give him praise. Give him glory. Give him honor.